everybody, this is Alex Merced from AlexMercedFooter.com and welcome to day 24 of 100 days of Go and Rust and today's topic will be concurrency. Now what is concurrency? Concurrency just means to be able to run multiple things at the same time. Now concurrency can happen in a couple different ways, like this is the way that JavaScript handles it, because JavaScript technically is a synchronous language, so there really is only one thread when you're running a, a, a JavaScript program a particular Java script. And um, basically the way it handles it is you can either use things like promises, so to create an event loop, also in the node and deno runtimes, you do have the ability to spawn what's called a child thread, which means you, you spawn another process um, in the computer that could run some sort of command or do something else, uh, etc. So those are all options to handle concurrency. Um, then in Go and Rust, you also have some options for concurrency. So in Go, you have what's called a Go routine. And a Go routine just means this thing will run concurrently with the main thread. Okay, so basically you have just sort of the main thrust of things that are happening. And then what you're doing is you're just creating a sort of a new chain of things that are going on at the same time. Okay, so let's kind of like how this would work. And essentially you just do that by saying go. Okay, you, you, you basically take a function and you say go and that function is run concurrently with everything else that's going on. And it's a go routine. So let's go to our go file. Okay, I'm gonna open this up in a full, open up this in terminal. Okay, let's take a look at our file here, run, run.go. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to, that's what I want to do. Actually, I'm just gonna pop all this out. We'll just make a new file. We'll just call this new file concurrency. Mm, actually, I won't do it in this folder just because I might interrupt that if I need to use that full file again. So, we'll just make a new folder for, we'll call it go scratch for like just one-off files. And we'll make concur.go. Okay, there we go. And then again, we just do the normal package main. I could probably spell things better. Package main uh, import uh, FMT. Okay. Okie dokie. And then I will just do a func main. Okay. This create. Uh, I think that's fine. I don't think that I have to change anything there, but let's just take a look. If I did anything funny. <coughs> uh, I think right now I'm fine. Because I'm only importing that one library, so I don't need to like list them out. Um, func main, and then essentially what I want to do is. Um, I'll create two functions. We'll say function one, func one. And what func one does is, let's see here. And what this does is going to say uh, fmt dot print line. I did that wrong. FMT dot print line because again the properties are what's exported by being capitalized. Print line. Hello world one. Control C. Okay, and then I'm going to do the two function. And this will be goodbye world. And 
there we go and essentially what would happen is I would say go one go two okay so essentially what happens is that the program starts it then tells the one function to run concurrently which means that the program will continue moving forward even though that function is running it'll then run two concurrently um, and then keep going and then what I'll do is I'll write the word done here uh, fm fmt dot print line done fmt dot print line begin and let's see how these prints show up here okay git well, no, I don't want to do that let me just make sure I'm in the right folder open image create terminal and what I want to do is go run concur dot go begin done hmm. we can run the two functions let's think about why let's take a look at the way the example code is Tenth dot second where's the second coming from see here if I do this if, if I do one two not using the word keyword go let's see if those work let's see if those work but not when I run them concurrently so let's think about that fmt that print line message going Let's see here. I'm not sure what the time is doing also say regime. Okay. Let's try that out. I think that's just basically making setting a timer of sorts. So time and what I'm going to do is put this here because I think what happens is that basically once it runs through all the commands even though they're being run concurrently it kills once the main thread is done it's all done so you have these two child threads but since the main thread has kind of run out of directions that thread kills itself killing the previous two threads so by putting in this delay of like I'm assuming it's a second it gives time for those these two to finish before it gets to this done. Yep, and that's exactly what happens. Okay, so basically, without some sort of delay, it does. the program will not wait for these concurrent uh, runs to go. Okay, so that's essentially what's going on there. So that's all fine and good. Now, what if I want these like processes to pass data to each other? This is where we get into channels, the next topic. Okay, so essentially what happens here, and just kind of look at the example code, what you do is you make a channel of type string, you save it in messages, and then what happens is that like in the uh, process, like in the, uh, in the go routine, you can then store data in that message, which be then becomes available to the main thread. So let's see like this example. So let's see here. How do I want to do this? Uh, what I'll do is I'm going to change, make another go routine. Go, and in this case, this will just be a, a anonymous function. So go func. And then what we need to do is before up here, we'll create a, like a, 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 a channel. So we'll just call this um, my channel. And then we'll use the walrus operator and we'll use make. And then what I want to do is make a channel. 
and we'll, it's uh, let's go back over here channel and it's a pipe string <coughs> okay so basically what I've done is made a channel type string what this does allows you to pipe stuff from different scopes in a sense so when I go in here I want to say uh, I think we're going to use the arrow here yep I'll use the arrow I'm going to say hey when this runs take my channel and then pipe into it the word this works and what's going to happen is that after we sleep everything for a second we'll do an fmt dot print line and we will print my channel okay let's run that expression go line 31 let's go funk oh, I'm also running that wrong uh, I wrote that right oh I have, to, I have to invoke it so I just get passed it a function definition but I got to also invoke the function see so that's so this this is the function definition and then this is me invoking that function so that should fix it okay and see that passed a memory position so that passed a pointer to that so let's see how they access that message ah so then I gotta pipe that into something else so that pipes this into this and then theoretically I would then have to make another variable we'll say um, over here we'll say result equals my channel And instead of printing line, because essentially this is just a pointer to where that data exists. So technically, this say, I guess what is happening is really like this is just saving this data onto the heap. And then what happens is passing the pointer to where that data is on the heap. So once that, so basically what you're doing here is you're just accessing whatever's in that pointer, which may or may not have yet changed, depending on like these concurrent things happening at the same time, whether the alteration to what's inside my channel have happened yet. And that's always the risk when you have concurrency. Like, do th the timing of things line up the way you want, but there's sometimes there's just tasks that you want to do concurrently because they're going to take a while and you don't necessarily want to block the execution of the rest of your code for that thing to finish. So you, if you've used JavaScript, this is a, why we use promises because I don't want to necessarily want to block my code for some API call that could maybe take a few seconds and prevent like images from loading and things like that. So let's see here. Use built-in print line function, not a function call. Oops. My bad. I meant to put result here. And it works. See, there you go. So again, I can, and it's, again, basically this just becomes a variable. So really what, it, I mean, basically from what I can tell here, really all a channel is, is just a variable you're declaring on the heap um, that you can then store data in so essentially this is really just a pointer to that location on the heap and then what I'm saying when this runs store this there at that location and then what I'm saying here take whatever stored at that location here um, okay I mean I'm not sure if it's any more complicated than that under the hood um, which makes but, but which begs the question why we just use pointers if it to do this but it's cool okay and let's see let's see if there's any interesting pieces to it. When we run the program ping, messages successfully pass from one Go routine to another. The channel by default sends and receives block until both the sender and receiver are ready. So this proper property allowed us to wait at the end of the program for the ping message without having to use any other synchronization. Well, see, there's a nice twist. Okay, so essentially what happens is because I'm receiving the message here, it's going to wait till a send occurs up here. So this will wait to execute. So this becomes more like a dot then okay so in JavaScript and basically says hey wait for this when this becomes available so it's like an async await so like this is like your await keyword so wait for this to have resolved before assigning the value to this okay so then now I now I see the benefit of it and why, why that's different than just assigning like a pointer to some memory on the heap because you you are creating this sort of delay synchronous synchronization mechanism so I could have a go routine at the end that sends data via channel 
and again that the code that eventually receives that channel will block until the first one sends until that go routine sends so that's pretty cool okay so we'll leave it at that we'll probably do some more concurrency later on but i want to make sure we head over to rust as well so in rust what we do is we're going to spawn threads okay we're going to spawn threads Okay, I'm just gonna show you an example here. So basically we'll import thread. And again, see they're also using like this time delay uh, tactic, again, to make sure that the main thread doesn't kill itself before the child threads. But here you, what you do is you spawn threads. Okay, so I can say spawn a thread and this thread will do this and I can spawn, this is code that's gonna run in the main thread and you know, to the extent that one finishes, uh, the, I mean the child thread finishes will be based on whether the when the main thread finishes. So let's head over to Rust. Do I have like just a basic file? Yeah, I have this run.rs file. Mm, I'll create another Rust. Scratch folder two, new Rust scratch folder. And I will create a new file, concur.rust. Okay, I'll open this in terminal. Okay. And let's just copy this example just so we can like see it go. Okay, let's just like walk through it. So again, we, we have these two libraries we're bringing in. So this is from the standard library. So this is gonna be the thing that allows us to spawn threads. This is probably gonna be a thing that just delays time. Okay. So in this case, we're saying thread to spawn. So we're spawning a new thread. Not sure what the pipe operator is doing there. <coughs> See if it actually explains that piece. Mm, maybe just look for other examples of threading spawn. And looks like, let's see here, does it mention it? Yeah, because I'm not 100% sure if that has to, like, if that relates specifically to the way. We spawn the thread. Let's just see if there's more application systems programming. Nope, that's all they say for concurrency. Okay, <clears throat> well, let's just take a look. Okay, so basically with spawning a thread, this is the code that will execute in the thread. I'm gonna assume that or operator sh or that those pipes should be there until I've seen otherwise. And then this becomes the, the block of code that runs concurrently. So if we're looping one through 10 times, and this basically is gonna print a message, and then we're going to sleep the thread. So that means we're gonna say, stop the thread for like a millisecond, okay? So basically it says a duration from milliseconds one, and you're putting the thread to sleep. So duration, that's what this is for, allows us to set like a time limit. So this allows us to generate a time amount of time, and this allows us to put that thread to sleep for that duration. So essentially it loops, then pauses for a millisecond, then loops, then pauses for a millisecond. Now in this case, this one's gonna loop one through five times. This is in the main thread. So essentially everything stops when this finishes. So there's a chance that we may not get through one through 10, um, depending on how long this takes. So let's play with this. Okay, so for, what was it? Uh, Rust C. Um, concur.go then we want to run concur oh no, concur.go ah there we go okay and so you notice it didn't go through one through ten like this says because again basically they're both delaying for like a millisecond so they're going to kind of be in sync with each other so it's gonna be like one, one, two, two, three, three, four, four. And then the main thread is done executing. So then the, the full thing stops. Now if I delayed this, let's say two milliseconds, let's see what we get instead. Because theoretically that would mean two runs of the top one. So my prediction is it would get up to a count of eight on that child thread. And that is correct. So you see it goes one on the main thread. That's gonna wait for two milliseconds, which means that that's two milliseconds of waiting for this, which means two loops happen. So 
one, two, then two from the main thread, and then you have two milliseconds, you see that so forth. Okay, and again, you could just delay things in time, but here's the, pro the problem with doing that, is that you may delay things longer than they need to be delayed for, because you wanna make sure everything happens, so there's better strategies. So let's take a look at some of these other strategies that might be possible. Okay, so let's take a look at the second example. Okay, so let's see here how they do the spawn thread. This is because the main thread completely return, returns a join handle. The join method on join handle return waits for the associated thread to finish. Okay, so what we can do here is we sit there and we say, uh, let me just see how they did that. Let handle, so the handle is going to equal the child thread. So let handle equal the join thread. So then what happens, okay, we're saying, hey, we're gonna store this thread in here so we can refer to its methods, and it has this join method. And this join method basically just says, this line of code doesn't terminate until this thread is finished. So this allows us to say, hey, wait for this thread to finish, and that unwrap would unwrap the end result, not that we're doing anything with it, okay? So we have the handle, which is just the thread, then dot join, dot unwrap. So regardless of the time, so if I change this back to one millisecond, and see this waited for the whole thing to finish. Okay, so it was like one, one, two, two, three, three, four, four. Then it kept going because we put this here. Now let's pretend I put this here. My question is gonna be like, if I put this here, Will it wait for the child thread to finish before it continues on the main thread in that case? So that means I'll see one through nine before I see the one through four. So let's test that out. Instead I get an error. Let's see here, why? Oh, because I need a semicolon. That would make a difference. Okay, and that's what we got. See, it, it basically, when it hits this line, it stops for that, it waits for that thread to stop before it goes any further, okay? And then it goes to this. So you have some control over like, you can just basically sync the threads that way. You can just say, okay, at this point, I wanna make sure that these threads are done before I go any further. But you can have sort of multiple concurrent threads going and that's pretty cool. Okay, so that's essentially how you do concurrency in Go and Rust. You see, it's not that complicated. You just sit there and say, hey, I wanna spawn this thread or I wanna generate this Go routine and go do this. And then I can be like, okay, wait till it's done. Now, what I'd like to see is if I can find some information on like the equivalent of like a channel, like how could I go receive data from there? I'm saying this join function, when I unwrap it, I'm getting some sort of value, but let's see here. I'm not probably not gonna find it in here. Um, so let's just take a look. Standard thread. and go to rust. Here we go, let's see here, spawning a thread. So we've seen all that, child.join, configuring threads. Modules provides an implementation of thread local storage for rust programs. Thread local storage is used to method of storing data into the global variable that each thread in the program will have its own copy of. Threads do not share this data, so access to this. A thread local key owns the value it contains and will destroy the value when the thread exits. Thread local key owns the value it contains and will destroy the value when the thread exit. It is created with thread local and can contain any value that is static. It provides an accessor function with that yields a shared reference to the value specified closure. So the way I read that is, is you can create a variable inside of a thread that's available to the other threads by using thread local, but that variable becomes no longer available once that thread is done. Um, so that's a thing. Naming thread, stack size, thread, lo thread local storage key, which owns its contents. So that's interesting. Again, there's more stuff you can always read in the Rust documentation. Okay, but again, that gives you the basic idea of like how concurrency works in these languages. My name is Alex Merced from alexmercetcoder.com. This is day 24 of our 50 day, uh, 100 days of Rust and Go. Um, have a great day and enjoy. So this means we're almost a quarter of the way through. 
um, so we'll see we'll see what we do content wise going forward um, I'll see y'all later mm, doo -doo -doo -doo.